Shout out to purestmushrooms.com for supporting my work. If you are interested in the medicinal properties of mushrooms and you want a discount code, check out the video description. Let's go set history on fire. I've just binge watched five episodes of the Hulu TV series Shogun, so my mind is very much on it. In light of that, I figure it may be interesting to do a video about the interplay between history and the events you see portrayed on the show. I guess a good place to start is a little bit of background about the origin of the show. It draws its inspiration from a historical fiction novel from 1975 by James Clavell, also entitled Shogun. As books go, Shogun was and still is insanely popular selling millions of copies worldwide. In 1980, the book was adapted into a TV series for the first time. Uh, that miniseries was also a huge hit. It was the only American TV production ever to be filmed on location entirely in Japan. It starred uh, Richard Chamberlain, Toshiro Mifune, who was one of the greatest Japanese actors ever, and perhaps you could even strike the qualifier Japanese, let's just say one of the greatest actors ever and even John Rhys Davies of uh, Gimli's fame in the Lord of the Rings movies. Given how popular the book and the original TV series were, it's really little surprise that in 2024 we're having a remake. This remake is much more visually stunning than the original ever was. The cinematography is just mind-blowing, it's so beautiful. Uh, the photography is amazing. The recreation of what Japan may have looked like in the late 1500s, early 1600s is also spot on and it's a joy to watch. Most of the show is in Japanese with subtitles. Um, the characters, okay, that's the only place where I'm not, like to tell you the truth, I'm not drawn into the characters. Like I don't find any of them, uh, I don't really care about any of them. And this is not a problem with the show. This is th the same was true for the book as well. That's just my only personal gripe with an otherwise beautifully crafted historical TV show. But enough with my opinion, let's go into the history of it all. The setting for our story is the time leading up to the Battle of the Sekigahara that took place in the year 1600, which is one of the most famous and important battles in Japanese history, because it represented the symbolic end of the Sengoku Jidai, uh, what was known as the Warring States period in Japan, which was a period of civil war that lasted for well over a century. Much of Shogun is all about the politics, intrigues, and infighting that characterizes the final phases of the Songoku Jedi. That's why it has been sometimes compared as a japanese theme version of Game of Thrones. The fate of the country was to be shaped, if not determined, by what happened in the plains of Sekigahara in October of the year 1600. I cover this topic fairly extensively in my series about Miyamoto Musashi, so you can check out those episodes of the History on Fire podcast. I also covered part of it in the series I did about Ikkyu Sojun. Since Ikkyu's life took place at the beginning of the Sengoku Jedi, whereas Musashi took place at the end. I'm going to do a bit of an abbreviated version here, just to give you at least the basics. The Sengoku Jidai began in the year 1467 and continued into the beginning of the 1600s, officially ending by 1615. To make a very long story short, the civil wars saw generations of warlords competing against one another for control over Japan. The emperor at this time was nothing but a figurehead with no power, and for a while none of the warlords were able to concentrate enough power to eliminate all their rivals. The result of this was never-ending wars that lasted over a century. The first of what would become known as the Three Unifiers was Oda Nobunaga, a ruthless warlord who massacred his opponents left and right and looked well on his way toward unifying Japan under his rule. Things, however, didn't quite work out for him since one of his lieutenants, Akechi Mitsuhide, decided that loyalty was overrated and, for reasons that are still highly debated, murdered his boss in 1582. There are many theories for to try to explain Mitsuhide's betrayal, from just a good old-fashioned power grab 
to instead there's a tale being told, which is debated by historians whether this is accurate or not, but a story goes that Mitsushida once had volunteered to send his own mother as a hostage among a group of enemies whose castles he was besieging on behalf of Nobunaga, guaranteeing that their lord would be well treated if he surrendered. Nobunaga, however, did not feel bound to Mitsushida's promise, so he had the guy crucified. And, not surprisingly, the man's soldiers were not thrilled with this, and so they killed Mitsushida's mother. This is one story that's told, but, again, historians, some historians argue this never happened and is a legend, but, you know, it could be one of the possible explanations. The reality is nobody knows for sure. Either way, Mitsushida in 1582 caught wind that Nobunaga was holding a tea ceremony in Kyoto with very few warriors protecting him. So in a surprise move, he led his men to attack the temple, leading Nobunaga to commit a ritual suicide, and one of Nobunaga's men to burn down the temple to prevent his enemy from being able to parade Nobunaga's head as a trophy. Nobunaga, the most feared man in Japan, was dead, soon to be followed by one of his sons, also hunted down by Mitsushida. One of Nobunaga's other lieutenants, Toyotomi de Yoshi, then promptly went to war with Mitsushida and put an end to his earthly existence. Hideyoshi mostly unified the country under his rule at this time. He had a problem, though. His only son had died in 1591. So lacking a direct heir, Hideyoshi chose as successor his nephew Hidetsugu. In 1593, however, Hideyoshi had a new son, and this created a bit of an awkward situation with Hidetsugu. Hideyoshi chose to solve the awkwardness by ordering Hidetsugu to commit ritual suicide and then massacring his entire family, over 30 between women and kids. Because, you know, being a warlord is not a sentimental business. Hideyoshi died in 1598, when his son was still much too young to rule. This meant that five of Hideyoshi's minions would act as regents until Hideyoshi's son would become old enough. If you can see this as a potential problem, and probably things not to work out according to Hideyoshi's son, you are 100% correct. Because you know how it is. I've, I've watched Game of Thrones. I know how these things play out. You know, the idea of these five ambitious guys playing babysitter to the next in line to be Shogun and not making a power move to gain power for themselves, there's a lot of wishful thinking there. One of the regents decided he wasn't so hot on babysitting Hideyori, Hideyoshi's son, and instead it was a grand idea to seize power for himself. The man was Tokugawa Ieyasu, who is... Uh, one of the lead characters in the Shogun series. The following months saw Japan breaking up into two competing camps. On one side, under the leadership of Ishida Mitsunari, were the forces loyal to Hideyori's claims. They were known as the Western forces. And against them was uh, Tokugawa and his allies. After several smaller battles, the two sides were ready for one final showdown at Sekigahara, and this happened on October 21st of the year 1600. Approximate estimates suggest the Western forces had over 100,000 men in the field against the less than 80,000 for Tokugawa. This was one of the largest battles of the age in Japan. Things didn't start great for Tokugawa, but proving that sometimes devious ways work better than strength, everything changed when one of the warlords of the Western army switched sides because he had been bribed by Tokugawa and this helped tilt the outcome of the battle. Now, that's some Shakespearean stuff right there. A minimum of 12,000 and a maximum of 40,000 died on the battlefield. Many who were not killed during the battle were later hunted down and killed in the October rain in the days to come. The triumph of Tokugawa was complete. He was now about to establish a claim on Japan that no one could take away from his family for generations to come. Loyal lords received great lands, 
enemies were either killed or disposed of prime lands and put in condition to never be a threat again. So as a result, after Sekigahara, Tokugawa claimed the title of Shogun in 1603. Shogun was basically the military ruler of Japan, while officially the emperor still was the emperor, in reality he had no power, and the shogun was the real power behind the throne. So, as a shogun, Tokugawa began redistributing all the spoils, however he had not completely eliminated all of his enemies. For one, you just can't wipe out that many warriors and clans all at once. But also he had been unable to eliminate Hideyori, as no doubt he would have liked to, but many lords who had joined the Tokugawa side had done so because they didn't like the other regions, but they still felt a minimum sense of loyalty to the memory of Hideyori's father. So they had been willing to fight on the Tokugawa side, they have even accepted that Tokugawa had essentially disinherited Hideyori from his claim to the throne, but they would have not appreciated the murder of Hideyori. So Tokugawa had allowed Hideyori to keep control of Osaka, and even had accepted a marriage between Hideyori and his uh, granddaughter. By 1614, however, Tokugawa decided to finish the job, so he used a small pretext to attack Hideyori, accusing him of rebelling. A massive campaign took place in 1614 and 1615. This led to the death of Hideyori, even the execution of his 80-year-old son, because Tokugawa was many things, but a nice guy was not among them. This was the end of the Sengoku period. Uh, for the next 250 years, Japan would be unified under Tokugawa rule. Now, despite finally uniting Japan, Tokugawa died around this time. Roughly one year later, in 1616, Tokugawa Ieyasu, the third and last of the great unifiers, died at the age of 75, uh, leaving the title of Shogun to his descendants. They would go on to rule Japan for the next couple of centuries. To make things extra confusing, though, the TV series, much like the book had done, changed all the names of the characters involved. This is probably because James Clavell wanted to have some freedom to fictionalize the real history, but the result is that, you know, you have uh, Tokugawa in the show is Toranaga, Hideyoshi is named the Taiko, and everyone else, their name has been changed, which, again, great for Clavel to be able to have a little more freedom, a little tricky for us to try to wrap the real history and, and tie it with what we see onto the screen. But either way, I hope this uh, brief outline of the Sengoku period, really obscenely brief outline, because as you may imagine, there are a lot of things that happened during that time that I've just glossed over, gives you at least a tiny bit of background to make sense of some of the events you see onto the screen and to understand how they relate to the real history of Japan.